Have you ever looked at something and then had a really great idea? What happened when you tried to explain it to somebody? Did they agree with you? Chances are they did not. They simply didn't get it. We all feel underappreciated at times. Working hard at thankless jobs, our achievements are sometimes overlooked. But if you are lucky, history might one day prove that you were right. I want to tell you a story just like that. Alfred Wegener was a German meteorologist, geophysicist, paleoclimatologist, and explorer. Wegener was hardcore. He is now recognized as one of the pioneers of polar exploration. Over the course of his lifetime, Wegener successfully completed three long major expeditions to the unexplored territories of the northeastern coast of Greenland. Along the way, he set up a research base, the first of its kind in Greenland, and made meteorological measurements of the climate in the Arctic zone. He and his brother Kurt pioneered the use of weather balloons in tracking the movement of air masses and studying air circulation. Wegner and his colleagues also did innovative work with ice cores. They were the first to core ice on a moving Arctic glacier. This work was particularly dangerous because they did not have modern technology or clothing prepared for extreme conditions. In 1930, Wegner attempted a fourth expedition to Greenland with the goal of measuring the thickness of its ice sheet. The expedition would be his last. Wegner underestimated the harsh and hostile weather of the uncharted far north, where temperatures dropped below negative 75 degrees Fahrenheit. The group became stranded in a vast frozen space with no radio equipment and dwindling provisions. And the expedition ended in a terrible disaster as Wegner eventually died of exhaustion and was buried in the frozen wasteland by his last companion, who perished not long after himself. Polar exploration cost Wegner his life, but interestingly enough, his biggest contribution to science did not come from inside the Arctic Circle. In fact, it didn't come from any one place at all. His biggest contribution to science is this book, The Origin of the Continents and Oceans, which he published in 1915 while serving in the German Army Weather Service during World War I. Wegner was fascinated by the shapes of the continents and land masses on Earth. As far back as the 15th century philosopher and statesman Sir Francis Bacon, Scientists had noticed that the continents of the world resembled a jigsaw puzzle. If you cut the continents out of the map, they seem to fit together like puzzle pieces. To explain this relationship, Wegener advocated for continental drift. These original world maps created by Wegener himself illustrate his hypothesis. He theorized that the continents of the world were once joined together in a single landmass, or supercontinent, and that they slowly moved apart over time. He called his supercontinent Pangaea. Wagner included a number of observations to support his hypothesis. Wagner noticed that some fossils of plants and animals which went extinct hundreds of millions of years ago, occurred on multiple continents. Scientists at the time generally believed that these fossils were produced by plants and animals which spread across the oceans across temporary land bridges, which either sunk into the ocean 
or disappeared when the ice melted. Like the Beringia Land Bridge, which connected Asia to North America. It formed during ice ages, when seawater got trapped in ice, sea level dropped, and land became exposed. Wegner instead proposed that these fossils were produced by organisms that lived on Pangaea and had wide distributions. Because their ranges spanned across the supercontinent, he argued, they left fossils behind on all of the land masses. Wegner's pioneering work in this area helped to establish the field of paleobiogeography, the science that deals with the geographic distribution of prehistoric plants and animals. Wegner also thought about the rocks on our planet. Wegner noticed that the sides of continents separated by oceans have very similar sequences of rocks and mountain chains. Although he wasn't a strong geologist, Wegner was well versed on the principles of original horizontality and lateral continuity, and reasoned that the rocks on the opposite sides of the ocean formed on Pangaea as continuous layers called strata, which were ripped apart and separated by continental drift when the supercontinent broke up. He also believed that continental drift could explain the distribution of coal on our planet. Wegner noticed that many coal deposits occur in locations with cold climates, including places inside the Arctic Circle where he had worked. Antarctica also, oddly enough, has a lot of coal. Even though coal tends to form from plants and vegetation in swamps with warm, humid climate. These conditions usually exist near the equator. So Wagner inferred that the coals in Antarctica and the Arctic Circle formed when those land masses were located near the equator at some point in the distant past. Of course, Wagner wasn't perfect. Even though he believed in continental drift, he couldn't really explain why or how it happened. Wegner supposed that gravitational and centrifugal forces caused the land masses to drift slowly toward the equator because the Earth is not a perfect sphere. But we now know that these forces are too weak to cause continental drift. Regardless, Wegener didn't have an explanation of how the continents could plow through oceanic crusts as they moved across the Earth's surface. For these reasons and others, the scientific community did not immediately embrace Wegener's hypothesis. Indeed, Wegener had many outspoken critics who regarded him as an outsider. After all, he was a meteorologist not a geologist, and he was a German to boot. Anti-German sentiments were still somewhat strong in the years after World War I, and it was often the case that Wegener couldn't or wouldn't defend his theories from attack from foreign scientists, as he did not have strong command of the English language. And so, Wegener's ideas were largely dismissed and forgotten for decades. History, however, would show that Wegener was actually just ahead of his time. We now know that continental drift, in one way or another, is a real phenomenon. Between 335 and 175 million years ago, there was a supercontinent on Earth, which we call Pangaea. This supercontinent was surrounded by a world ocean which we call Panthalassa. There was also a small sea called the Tethys. Pangaea formed about 335 million years ago during the Carboniferous period and broke up early in the Jurassic period. Since then, the continents have been drifting toward their current positions. 
Today, continental drift serves as the foundation for the theory of plate tectonics. After decades of work, geologists have learned that Earth, like an onion, consists of many layers. These layers can be divided among three main levels, the core, the mantle, and the crust. The crust and mantle together make up the lithosphere. Plate tectonics is the theory that Earth's outermost layer, the lithosphere, is a patchwork of plates that move around each other over time. There are three types of boundaries between these plates. At transform plate boundaries, two plates simply slide past each other. The most famous transform plate boundary is the San Andreas Fault. Faults are fractures, and all plate boundaries are faults. In this case, rocks on opposing sides of the boundary at San Andreas move in opposite directions. At divergent plate boundaries, two plates move apart. They move in opposite directions. They diverge and spread apart. Divergent plate boundaries occur at the Mid-Ocean Ridge, a continuous underwater mountain chain located at the bottom of the ocean. It is the longest mountain chain in the world. It wraps around the planet like the seams of a baseball. Finally, at convergent plate boundaries, two plates collide. One plate, the colder, denser plate, is forced below the other through a process called subduction. The dense plate sinks deep into the earth. The other is often uplifted. It rises above the ground. You will often find mountains at convergent plate boundaries located above sea level. As the collisions cause the rocks to fold, bend, tilt, and rise. Beneath the sea, convergent plate boundaries are located near deep ocean trenches, like the famous Mariana Trench in the Eastern Pacific. The bottom of the Mariana Trench is the deepest part of our ocean and planet. The Mariana Trench is deeper than Mount Everest is tall. At all these boundaries, the plates are moving. The movement of tectonic plates is a very, very slow process, owing to the rigidity of rock and the friction that is created by rocks that move past each other. The Americas are separated from Africa and Europe by a divergent plate boundary. We know that the Americas are moving away from Europe and Africa at a rate of about two and a half centimeters per year. Although the movement of the plates is incredibly slow, these small movements add up over millions and billions of years of Earth history, resulting in the major changes in the geography of our planet. The movement of the plates is caused by a global conveyor belt of rock, one created by geologic processes that occur deep beneath our ocean. In this conveyor belt of rock, the Earth's crust is constantly being destroyed and replenished. The crustal rocks destroyed in one location are replaced by rocks created in another. There are two types of crust, the continental crust on land and the oceanic crust below the sea. The oceanic crust mainly consists of an extrusive igneous rock called basalt that originates from the cooling of magma. The continental crust, located beneath the land masses, in contrast, consists of granite and intrusive igneous rock. Oceanic crust is destroyed in subduction zones at convergent plate boundaries and created at divergent plate boundaries called the mid-ocean ridge. When oceanic crust sinks into the earth at a convergent plate boundary through subduction, 
it melts under the intense heat and pressure that exists deep in our planet and turns into hot fluid molten rock called magma. Magma rises to the surface at the mid-ocean ridge due to heat convection. At this divergent plate boundary, it cools and turns into new oceanic crust. The new crust displaces the existing rock and causes sea floor spreading. As a result of sea floor spreading, the oceanic crust created at the divergent plate boundary will move until it arrives at a convergent plate boundary where there is subduction, completing the conveyor belt that powers the movement of the tectonic plates. Plate tectonics has emerged as one of the strongest theories in the field of geology. There is now a wealth of evidence for it. We now know more about the ocean floor than ever before. In no small part, due to naval advancements in developing high resolution seafloor maps during World War II and the Cold War. One of the founding fathers of plate tectonics is Harry Hammond Hess. Hess was a rear admiral in the United States Navy and Navy Reserve who served in World War II. He applied his knowledge of seafloor spreading to develop the theory of plate tectonics in the 1950s and 60s. As he pointed out, there are a number of features on the ocean floor, like the mid-ocean ridge, that could only be explained by the formation of oceanic crust. This work also led to recognition that volcanoes and earthquakes are located near plate boundaries. Indeed, we now know that it is the movement of the plates that causes earthquakes, and that plate boundaries are places where molten rock can rise to the surface and be extruded through volcanic vents. Around the same time that the Navy was developing high resolution maps of the seafloor, scientists were establishing a new field of geology, paleomagnetism the science of studying Earth's ancient magnetic field. Paleomagnetism involves the study of igneous rocks containing magnetite, a magnetic iron oxide mineral. Because it is magnetic, the particles of magnetite in molten magma align themselves with Earth's magnetic field. When the fluid cools and turns into igneous rock, the particles become locked into those orientations. So scientists can study the magnetite in such rocks to determine the direction and angles at which they formed relative to the Earth's surface. Work such as this ultimately showed that plate tectonics and continental drift are necessary to explain the orientations of magnetite minerals found in most igneous rocks. Today, paleomagnetism allows us to produce models and reconstructions such as this one, which shows the locations of the tectonic plates and land masses at various times in Earth history. Indeed, paleomagnetism is the basis for paleogeography, the study of Earth's prehistoric geography. It's been more than 100 years since Alfred Wegener first proposed the idea of continental drift. And although his ideas were underappreciated in his lifetime, history proved that he was far ahead of the rest of the scientific community. Today, his legacy is felt throughout the geological sciences and underlines many important concepts in historical geology. Not too bad for just a meteorologist.